Welcome to week 46. I'm Hilary and we have chronologically journeyed far into the Old Testament and we're currently waist deep in the prophets' writings, which I'm finding really interesting actually. Last week I was considering the when and the how of the writing of Lamentations and how it was sort of set up, proposing that whether it is written before or after the destruction of Jerusalem, it serves a similar purpose by creating a peace that the suffering people can get on board with. And once they're on board, leading them to consider they are part in it all and what they need to do now. So it's day one, it's Lamentations chapters four to five. In chapter three, I proposed that this was the character of Queen Jerusalem speaking again as part of a conversation with another character who turned up in chapter two. That this is her voice that's crying out to God again, which Jeremiah did prophesy would happen when the people return. And it ends with her asking God to deal with her enemies, to chase them down in his anger and destroy them. So in chapter four, God's voice joins the conversation, observing that the guilt of my people is greater than that of Sodom. And as we've often seen in prophets writing, God's voice can switch between God and the representative of God from the first person to the third person but still talking about God and now the anger of the Lord is satisfied for instance flipping to the third person and it flows from that into the voice of the author the historical account we couldn't go into the streets without danger to our lives if we hid in the wilderness they were waiting for us there and then it travels on into prayer that is real and it's raw. And that's something, again, that suffering people can really connect with. And then that leads them to declare, restore us, O Lord, bring us back to you again. Give us back the joy that we once had. Those words that would remind them and us of David's words of repentance. So we're on to the book of Ezekiel, a new book alert, of course. And this book tells us something of the timing. It's the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. And Jehoiakim was a descendant of David. And while he had been on the throne, the people believed that they were untouchable, really. They were safe to do what they wanted. Lamentations mentioned that our king, the Lord's anointed, the very life of our nation, was caught in their snares. We had thought that his shadow would protect us against any nation on earth. But he, along with most of the people of Jerusalem at this point, are taken into captivity by Babylon in 597 to 8 BC. And five years later, we are here with one of those people, Ezekiel the priest. Both Jeremiah and Daniel are prophets kind of around the same time, but each of them has their own style, their own experience of being a prophet. Ezekiel's is that he is a priest before he's called to be a prophet and that he has these incredible interactive visions. So it's day two and it's Ezekiel chapter one to four. And what stood out to me straight away was the context of the vision. Ezekiel says, as I looked, I saw a great storm coming from the north. And this reminded me of one of Jeremiah's first visions. He saw a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. And one of Isaiah's references was a powerful army comes like smoke from the north. So we've got these three very similar symbols, the stormy clouds, the steaming boiling water and the smoke all depicting God sending the Babylonians. And this is the context for the vision. This first scene tells us that the rest of the symbols tell a story connected to this happening and this timing. We know that it is God who has brought phase one of the justice plan, the Israelites' rejection of him being poured back out on them. And we know at this point that phase two, the destruction of Jerusalem, is still to come. I think God is maybe showing Ezekiel that he has been and is still in this movement against Israel, but it's a totally different way to how he showed other prophets so far. However, he isn't the first to have a vision of God like this. 
Moses and the 70 elders saw God and described that under his feet, there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. Ezekiel sees this too, something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on this throne high above was a figure whose appearance resembles a man. And he goes on to describe that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like gleaming amber, flickering like a fire. And from his waist down, he looked like a burning flame shining with splendor. Now, Daniel will see something very similar in his encounter with God. He sees a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like precious gems. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches and his arms and his feet shone like polished bronze. And the Apostle John will describe him as a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair are as white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes are like flames of fire. And he also notices that his feet are like polished bronze. So is it that God appears slightly differently to each of them? Or is it that they use different words to describe the same thing? Ezekiel will say this, this is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. And that's an important statement. He's saying, this is how I would describe it. So when it comes to how he describes the four beings, is it the same beings that John will see? just described differently. So for instance, Ezekiel sees each being has these four-sided faces with the four different creatures. But John, when he sees them, he only sees one of each of those creatures, only one side at a time. Is it possible that John saw each of them when that side of their face was facing him? So it looked like they only had that one face. Ezekiel is going to see them moving in lots of different directions in his vision. So perhaps that is why he sees more angles, as John will only see them talking, not moving. But John will see six wings and Ezekiel will only see four. So is it possible that there was a third set tucked away that Ezekiel just didn't notice? Ezekiel doesn't notice the eyes on the wings this time, but he does in a later vision in chapter 10. This is how it looked to him, and that is how it might seem to John. This would be very in keeping with how we describe our visions and our dreams. We do often miss detail, especially when it's a really powerful experience like this. We might remember it next time, or if we go back into that vision, we might see more. So in this heavenly vision set in the context of the judgment of Israel at that time, God speaks and his subject matter confirms that context. I am sending you to the nation of Israel, the rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. And the calling of Ezekiel stood out to me. It's a very difficult calling. He needs a clear job remit. What will be required of him? What he should expect? His remit is to be a prophet among the people in exile. He's required to let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. God tells him, listen carefully to them for yourself. And then God gives him an experience in the vision of eating a scroll and then going and giving the people the message. That's the how to do his job. But what can he expect? Well, he can expect rebellion, whether they listen or they refuse to listen. For remember, they are rebels. <laughs> he can expect abuse, threats, dirty looks. He can even expect not to be popular, but he can also expect to not really care because God has made him as obstinate and as hard hearted as they are. He's going to be really determined. It takes him a week or so to recover from this heavenly vision with God. He's overwhelmed, he says. And you can picture people passing by sort of saying, what's going on with Ezekiel? But once he's ready, God pads out the detail. There's a job title, Watchman for Israel, and he is to warn people immediately when he has a message. No procrastinating. But if God hasn't given him a message, he is to keep 
quiet and there's another interactive instruction experience for that. And it's all about the interaction in day three and Ezekiel five to eight. I think this is the first time that we see prophecy without words, a visual experience for the hearer that conveys a warning, a living installation piece. I think in my hurry through Ezekiel in the past, I miss that this whole thing is public. While all the people are watching, it says, this is an illustration to them of what will happen to Jerusalem. There is a set with sculpture-like elements like the illustrated brick representing Jerusalem and various other pieces that are designed to enact the coming siege. Every so often there's a scene that's acted out like bread is baked over dung and eaten or rationed water is drunk and there's a final act with hair and fire. It's a one-man show with a run of over a year and that gives people plenty of time to hear about it and travel to it. The first words that we assume are spoken come at the end like a kind of epilogue, monologue, but it could also have been later. By this time, we would assume that everyone knows about the Ezekiel show, which I suspect is part of the plan. You know, people will be having dinner conversation about it. And while his words may be mocked, they will at least be shared. The messages often come with a visual aid, facing a certain way, clapping, stamping, like we saw with a smashed clay jar before. And what's clever about this is it makes the words more memorable. A visual will prompt our memory. Think of a scene in a favourite movie or a book and you will find it's easier to remember the lines that you were trying to remember. I also considered what is the purpose. And the messages are a report of what is going to happen. They're not a warning of how they can avoid it. So why bother telling them? We know that part of the purpose is to keep the tool of prophecy in their midst, that God is still speaking through and to his people. And when we consider how removed prophecy is from many churches, this is an interesting point. He's also communicating that he sees them. They may think that the Lord doesn't see us. He's deserted our land. But not only can he see everything, but he can transport someone from Babylon to Jerusalem and make them a fly on the wall. I know what you are saying, for I know every thought that comes into your minds. The exiles can't change things, it's too late, but they can turn back to God themselves, bringing their children up to be God's people. And I think this is a big part of the purpose for these messages. Then they will know that I am the Lord is a repeated theme. With Ezekiel still in Jerusalem within this vision, we go into day four, Ezekiel 9 to 12. And that's what first stood out to me as I read this. This vision is about Jerusalem. The clear message is still the imminent destruction of Jerusalem. The language of it, though, is similar to what is used in other places. And we would expect that of Daniel, who is living in the same era. But John, in his book to Revelation, and Jesus, when he prophesies something similar, they're not talking about this era that we're in. They're talking of a time ahead of them. So it's interesting to me that we may happily conclude that Ezekiel's symbolic language speaks of the Babylonian takeover, but start thinking that Daniel's is talking about something else. We're going to look at that in more detail when we get there, I suspect. But more commonly, some Christians will come to Jesus's and John's very similar symbolic descriptions of powers and coming destruction and decide that they are not symbols that they are literally going to happen as they are described. And this causes us to then look at Ezekiel and Daniel in that same light and decide that these things must be about a time still to come because they haven't literally happened in history. And I would have once believed teaching along those lines as well. But when a lot of it started to clash with the God I was coming to know, I started to reconsider that. And this year in the Old Testament is really helping that process. So we see six appointed men with weapons, which would probably represent the Babylonian army, with number six being the number for man. 
And with them was a man dressed in linen who is carrying a writer's case at his side. Now it's a man that's dressed in linen that Daniel and John describe in their visions of the Lord. So it's likely this man in Ezekiel's vision is the Lord and that he's to walk through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all who weep and sigh because of the detestable sins being committed in their city. And that takes us back in thought to the last plague on Egypt and the mark that was placed on their houses to mean that death passed over them. The four beings are back again, but this time there's more definition. They're defined as cherubim. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the same living beings I had seen beside the Kibar River. And that vision, of course, had been about the destruction of Jerusalem. I love that still within the vision, Ezekiel is to prophesy against people loudly. I mean, he's not there physically, he's there spiritually, but he's to, he's to prophesy to a group in Jerusalem while his body is still in a house in Babylon. Perhaps we should not limit God to only being able to commission us for work where we physically are. And I noticed that people are starting to listen to this little subtle change. And the message of encouragement Ezekiel has may help with this. It says, son of man, the people still left in Jerusalem are talking about you and your relatives and all the people of Israel who are in exile. They are saying those people are far away from the Lord, from the temple. So he's now given us their land. And God says, although I could have scattered you in the countries of the world, I will be a sanctuary to you during your time in exile. I, the sovereign Lord, will gather you back from the nations where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel once again. Also, after Ezekiel's incredible experience of being taken in vision to Jerusalem, it says that he tells the exiles everything that the Lord had shown him. Now, this is different from a message. This would be a story that would be hard not to listen to and it'd be full of familiar places and people and descriptions for them. When Ezekiel performs his next symbolic show for the people, instead of God saying, well, they just won't listen, they're rebels, he says, for perhaps they will pay attention to this. And sure enough, they do. The people of Israel have asked you, what does all this mean? And that is a bit of progress. Okay, it's the last day for this week. It's day five, Ezekiel 13 to 15. And what stood out to me again was the false prophets. A couple of weeks ago in Jeremiah, we considered that the definition of a false prophet reveals something of the attributes of a real prophet, that they spend time in the Lord's presence, that they only prophesy when God actually gives them a message, that they encourage those who are doing well and they discourage actions that would take us further away from God. And also that because there's false dreams, that means that there are real dreams that God is sending. And one of the purposes of those dreams was to help us remember his ways. So continuing that exercise, lesson one from today's reading would be false prophets of Israel who are inventing their own prophecies, following their own imaginations, but have seen nothing at all. Now, simplifying the message from that translation, it looks like they just make something up, like a piece of creative writing. But closer inspection show those two key words. We've got inventing, which is actually the word for heart or mind. And then imaginations, which is actually the word for spirit. So it's talking about what they believe, what they want, are actually creating these messages. For instance, if they have a desire to be well-liked, that desire will create a word that will be pleasing to the listener. If they want to make money, the love of money will create a great sounding message. If they believe that God's temple protects them, that false belief forms its own message. It's not that God is speaking and the message has to go through these filters of beliefs and wants. It's that they actually generate the message and that person might not even be aware that that is happening, although God does say that they do in this case. So I think a real prophet isn't someone who has no filters, no beliefs or wants. It's that they're really aware of their filters and they learn to spot words that sound an awful lot like what they want. 
These false prophets, they have selfish agendas, but even a good agenda, like a desire to see one physically healed, can create a message that we want for them rather than a message that God needs them to hear at that point. But if we're aware of our desire to see them healthy again, we can kind of lay that down when we come to listen or we can examine what we think we're hearing in light of that. The lesson two is they have done nothing to repair the breaks in the walls around the nation. Interesting. These evil prophets deceive my people by saying all is peaceful when there is no peace at all. It's as if the people have built a flimsy wall and the prophets are trying to reinforce it by covering it with whitewash. A heavy rainstorm will undermine it. Great hailstones and mighty winds will knock it down. And when the wall falls, the people will cry out, what happened to your whitewash? Now, one of the words that Paul uses to describe the function of prophecy in the church is edification. And it's a word that means a structure or a building. And in this context, it's figurative. It's like building up, enabling someone's growth in God. And this definition of a false prophet, it illustrates the opposite. It's not that they tear down, it's that they create a false building up. Everything is fine message that papers over the cracks. True prophecy's job, therefore, is partly to uncover those cracks, help the person to see what needs attention, perhaps something they hadn't seen before or confirm something that they knew but they'd been avoiding. It's a message that isn't easy to hear, but we can give our attention to it and it could save us from later just crumbling or falling over in a storm. Your know, warning and wisdom for cracks, I think are a really important part of what a prophet is to do in the role of edification. God puts it this way, by lying to my people who love to listen to lies, they like the yes people, you actually kill those who should not die. Lastly this week I noted the verse, son of man, the leaders have set up idols in their heart and the same is true of the people of Israel. I'm just noting the context is literal idol worship. What they are literally worshipping has now taken a place in their hearts, forming who they are and how they think and therefore what they are doing. I've heard this concept taught to kind of back up the idols of materials or money. And while there is something that isn't good about the power that we can give to wanting money and things, this passage isn't talking about that. It's literally about false gods that they have bowed down to and prayed to and let into their heart. Okay, week 46 is in the bag. I'm going to see you next time. The Crumb Blog comes out each Thursday in 2022 and then lives in YouTube for eternity. If you want a reminder of new blogs each week, pop your email address on the website link below. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it will be easier to find it in your subscription tab. See you soon.